Hey guys, how's it going? Mr Mitchell here. In this video we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the electricity topic of the higher physics course. So let's get started. So for the electricity topic, the SQA split this into five key areas or five subtopics. And the first one is called monitoring and measuring AC. We then have current, potential difference, power and resistance, which is a lot of recap from National 5 Physics. We then have electrical sources and internal resistance, which was all new stuff this year. And we then had capacitors for section 4. And lastly, semiconductors and PN junctions for section 5. So we'll go through each of these in turn, starting with number 1. So in the first section, monitoring and measuring AC, you need to know that AC is a current which changes direction and instantaneous value with time. So this is basically just the definition of alternating current. And because that current is changing over time, we can say that its instantaneous value is going to change over time. You also need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving root mean square, RMS, and peak values. So we have the relationship between peak and RMS voltage, and the relationship between peak and RMS current. So we have VRMS equals V peak over root 2, and IRMS equals I peak over root 2. Or you could remember these in the form of V peak equals root 2 VRMS, and I peak equals root 2 IRMS. So remember the peak values should always be bigger than the RMS values. Lastly for section 1 we have determined frequency, peak and RMS values from graphical data. And we're given the equation for the period of a signal or a wave, T equals 1 over F. So what this means is you need to be able to look at oscilloscope traces and from that work out the peak voltage, the period and then the frequency of the signal or the wave pattern on the screen. Moving on we have section 2 which is current, potential difference, power and resistance. And as I said earlier most of this topic is actually just a recap from National 5 Physics. So firstly it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving potential difference, current, power and resistance. Solutions may involve several steps. So all of these equations were seen at National 5 Physics. So we have the equation for Ohm's law, V equals IR. We have three power equations here, P equals IV, P equals I squared R and P equals V squared over R where remember you just choose which one to use based on the data that you're given in the question. We then have the two relationships for total resistance. So we have the one for series circuit and we have the one for a parallel circuit. So total resistance in series, remember RT equals R1 plus R2 plus dot dot dot, you just add them all together. And for total resistance in parallel, we have this 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus dot 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 relationship. So this inverse relationship to find the total resistance. It then says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving potential divider circuits. So remember we have two equations which can be used for potential divider circuits. So we've got this one when the supply voltage Vs is known, and we've got this one when the supply voltage Vs is not known. And you can see that this one on the left is kind of like a ratio of resistances, whereas this one on the right is like a ratio of voltages is equal to a ratio of resistances. Next for section 3 we have electrical sources and internal resistance. So firstly it says to know the terms electromotive force, also known as EMF, internal resistance, lost volts, terminal potential difference which can be shortened to TPD, ideal supplies or an ideal circuit as opposed to a real circuit, a short circuit and an open circuit. So these are just definitions that you need to learn and terms that you need to be able to use in sentences. It then says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving EMF, lost volts, terminal potential difference, current, external resistance and internal resistance. So we essentially have our equation relating EMF and internal resistance here which is E equals V plus IR where capital E is the EMF, capital V is the terminal potential difference and I is the current, and lastly, small r is the internal resistance. We can also say though that this terminal potential difference capital V is just the same as being equal to IR, so this is just Ohm's law V equals IR. So remember the top tip is that you can actually substitute for this V into this equation to get an expression in terms of the current, internal resistance R, external resistance R, and the EMF E. You also need to be able to describe an experiment to measure the EMF and internal resistance of a cell. So remember all you would need to do is connect up a cell in series with a variable resistor and an ammeter and then have a voltmeter in parallel with the cell. And you would then change the resistance in the circuit by adjusting the variable resistor which in turn will change the current in your circuit and for a range of different current values in your circuit you would measure the terminal potential difference or the voltage across the battery. And from these results of terminal potential difference versus current you would draw a graph with terminal potential difference on the y-axis, current on the x-axis and you would get a negatively sloping line from which you can estimate the EMF from being the y-axis intercept and the internal resistance of the cell from the negative of the gradient of the line. Lastly it says to determine EMF, internal resistance and short circuit current using graphical analysis. So this means if you're given a graph, 
Can you work out the EMF from it, the internal resistance from it, and also the short circuit current? So remember for a short circuit current, we say that the load resistance or external resistance capital R is equal to zero, which means that our terminal potential difference big V will equal zero. And therefore, when we sub that into this equation for EMF, we get essentially big E is equal to I small r. We can just sub in V equals zero for short circuit current. Moving on for section four, we have capacitors. And the first thing you need to know is that a capacitor of one farad will store one coulomb of charge when the potential difference across it is equal to one volt. So this is like the definition of the farad. It then says to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving capacitance, charge, and potential difference. So we have C equals Q over V, where C is capacitance in farads, Q is your charge in coulombs, and V is your potential difference in volts. Moving on, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to determine the charge stored on a capacitor for a constant charge in current. So remember this equation from National 5 Physics, Q equals IT, where Q is the charge in coulombs, I is the current in amps, and T is the time in seconds. And this just comes, remember, from the definition of electrical current, which is the electric charge transferred per unit time. It then says to know that the total energy stored in a charged capacitor is equal to the area under a charge potential difference graph. And that's the same as the work done in charging the capacitor. You should also be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving energy, charge, capacitance, and potential difference. So remember our three energy equations for capacitors, and remember you just choose which one to use depending on the information that you're given in a question. So we have E equals a half QV, E equals a half CV squared, and E equals a half Q squared over C, where the symbols have the same meanings as what we've said above, but capital E is our energy measured in joules. Next you need to know the variation of current and potential difference with time for both charging and discharging cycles of a capacitor in an RC circuit, i.e. the charging and discharging curves. So you need to know the graphs for current against time, potential difference across a capacitor against time, and also potential difference across a resistor against time for both the charging and discharging of a capacitor. And remember these graphs were the results from the experiments we looked at for the theory videos. You also need to know the effect of resistance and capacitance on charging and discharging curves in an RC circuit. So remember increasing the resistance of a resistor or increasing the capacitance of a capacitor will increase the time taken for a capacitor to charge and discharge. So it will take a longer time to actually reach its maximum potential difference for example, or it will take a longer time to decrease to zero current. Lastly, it says to describe experiments to investigate the variation of current in a capacitor and voltage or potential difference across a capacitor with time for the charging and discharging of capacitors. So again, we did this in the experiments that we looked at in the theory videos, and you need to be able to describe how you would do these. So remember, you would set up your circuit with all the required apparatus, and you would then measure at regular time intervals the potential difference across the capacitor and the current in the capacitor. And you could record these in tables and then plot graphs from them, and that way you're going to see the results that we were talking about up here. Lastly, we have section 5, which is semiconductors and PN junctions. And you'll notice that when we talk about this section, there's very little in terms of calculations that could be used. Maybe for solar cells, for example, you might be expected to use a power equation such as P equals IV, which links power, current and voltage, and maybe one or two of the other power equations, but apart from that, that's very much just theory based for this section. So the SQA have outlined in great detail here what they want you to know for this section. So that's why it's a bit more wordy than the other ones. So firstly, you need to know the terms conduction band and valence band, so be able to define both of those. It then says to know that solids can be categorised into conductors, semiconductors or insulators by their band structure and their ability to conduct electricity. Every solid has its own characteristic energy band structure. For a solid to be conductive, both free electrons and accessible empty states must be available. Next you need to be able to explain qualitatively the electrical properties of conductors, insulators and semiconductors using the electron population of the conduction and valence bands and the energy difference between the conduction and valence bands. And we'll outline, and these are actually outlined below here. You also need to know the electrons and atoms are contained in energy levels. When the atoms come together to form solids, the electrons then become contained in energy bands separated by gaps. For metals, we have the situation where one or more bands are partially filled. So we say that some metals have free electrons and partially filled valence bands, and therefore they are highly conductive. Some metals have overlapping valence and conduction bands. Each band is partially filled and therefore they are conductive. In an insulator though, you should know that the highest occupied band called the valence band is full. The first unfilled band above the valence band is the conduction band, 
and for an insulator, the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is large, and at room temperature there is not enough energy available to move electrons from the valence band into the conduction band where they would be able to contribute to conduction. There is therefore no electrical conduction in an insulator. So what this is doing here is explaining in terms of band theory how an insulator works. For a semiconductor, we can also explain this in terms of band theory, and it says that in a semiconductor the gap between the valence band and conduction band is smaller and at room temperature there is sufficient energy available to move some electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, allowing some conduction to take place. And remember that an increase in temperature increases the conductivity of a semiconductor, or in other words it reduces the resistance. You should also know that during manufacture semiconductors may be doped with specific impurities to increase their conductivity resulting in two types of semiconductor, either a p-type or an n-type semiconductor, depending on which way you've doped it. So remember if you dope a semiconductor material with a group 5 element, then it becomes an n-type material, but if you were to dope it with a group 3 element like boron, then it becomes a p-type material. And it doesn't hurt to be able to describe how the n-type and p-type doping works. You should also know that when a semiconductor contains the two types of doping, p-type and n-type, in adjacent layers, we have a p-n junction formed. There is an electric field in the p-n junction. The electrical properties of this p-n junction are used in a number of devices. So remember the p-n junction is used in things like LEDs and solar cells. You should also know the terms forward bias and reverse bias in relation to p-n junctions. So forward bias reduces the electric field in the p-n junction, whereas reverse bias increases the electric field in the p-n junction. You should also be able to explain how LEDs work in terms of band theory, so you should know that LEDs are forward biased p-n junction diodes that emit photons. The forward bias potential difference across the junction causes electrons to move from the conduction band of the n-type semiconductor towards the conduction band of the p-type semiconductor. Photons are emitted when electrons fall from the conduction band into the valence band either side of the junction. And lastly, you need to also be able to describe how solar cells work in terms of band theory. So it says to know that solar cells are p-n junctions designed so that a potential difference is produced when photons are absorbed. And remember the key word here is that this is known as the photovoltaic effect. The absorption of photons provides energy to raise electrons from the valence band of the semiconductor to the conduction band. The p-n junction causes the electrons in the conduction band to move towards the n-type semiconductor and a potential difference is produced across the cell. And remember many solar cells will usually be connected together to create a solar panel. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching, if you made it to the end I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.